You have to imagine my surprise then to hear the U4S and basically find it to be everything that the Neo was and more. What's going on everyone? Precog from headphones.com and today I'm going to be talking about the 64 Audio U4S. This is the brand's latest release. It is a hybrid IM with three balanced armatures and one dynamic driver that clocks in at $1,100 which incidentally makes it the cheapest IM in their lineup, their universal lineup that is. So 64 Audio actually reached out to myself and some other reviewers several months ago, and I've pretty much had them in my ears ever since. And I'm looking forward to talking to you guys about their sound signature. Well, that's what I'd like to say, but because this is a review, I do have to go through some of the specifications and the stuff that you're going to be getting in the box. That being said, let's talk about what you're going to be getting with the U4S. I honestly think that 64 Audio has made some decent strides in this department in the past few years, given that their previous unboxing experiences were pretty pretty middling to say the least, and that's, that's being generous. So this is the assortment of tips that is coming with the U4S, and it's on this little spider wheel thing. You definitely have a good amount of options here. I believe there are foam tips, there are CP145s from SpinFit, and then you have the 64 Audio Wideboy silicone tips as well. Yeah, I don't use the stock case, but in case you were wondering, this is the stock case that comes with the U4S. It is their leather hockey puck case. It's a nice case, pretty protective. I personally though tend to prefer the aluminum puck case, which is just a little bit more substantial. And the really nice thing about the, the aluminum puck cases actually is that they have this custom foam insert at the top that lets you store the Apex modules as well as a cleaning tool. Oh, and something pretty cool that they're choosing to include with the U4S is an M12 Apex module, which is the gold one down there. If you're not familiar with what the Apex modules are, they are essentially like filters that sort of attenuate or boost the bass response of the IM. And they do this by virtue of releasing air essentially. And speaking of which, there are definitely some other benefits to this system as well. It sort of can relieve some of the pressure buildup that occurs with IMs that are fully sealed. This is the U4S. You can see it follows the same sort of triangular shell design that their other IMs use. It's very comfortable for me. I've honestly been able to wear most of the 64 IMs for like five to 10 hours at a time, no problem. But of course that's going to be subjective to everyone. And something I will point out is that there is a bit of a vent at the back of the IM for the dynamic driver. Something that I've found is that I have to position the U4S a bit differently in my ear than I do some of the other 64 audio IMs in order to not block off this vent. But it's not a big deal, it's just that I can't like fully deep insert it like I would some of their other full balanced armature IMs which don't have a vent. And here's the faceplate of the IM. It's pretty subtle, but it is sort of based upon or inspired from the aesthetic of a meteorite. And if you wanted to see how they would normally fit in my ears, this is how it looks. I personally think that's something that the 64 audio IMs nail, but again, that's always going to be subjective to your own unique ear anatomy. For reference, I would say that I have smallish medium sized ears and I use um, small to medium sized silicone ear tips. Before I talk about the sound of the U4S, let's take a step back and talk about the 64 Audio Neo. This IM was released a couple of years ago and at the time it was one of my favorite IMs, so much so that I purchased my own. Now, the reason for this is because it was just an excellent rendition of an L-shaped sound signature. It was extremely bassy, it had a thick, lush mid-range, and while its treble response was somewhat darker, it also had very good sound stage as well. Now, I say was one of my favorite IMs because I ended up selling it, and that's also why I don't have it in my hands right now to show you guys, and we have an image here instead. That aside, there were a few reasons why I sold it. Like I said, it was quite dark even though it had the Tia driver and the bass quality itself while it was very like it was like intoxicating I guess the control itself was not the greatest especially past like 200 hertz or so moving into the mid bass it was just a little bit too bloated at times I guess if you will now bear in mind that the Neo was and still is a $1,700 IM you have to imagine my surprise then to hear the U4S and basically find it to be everything that the Neo was and more so let's talk about that so the main distinction that you're going to hear between the U4S and the Neo is in their treble responses. Like I said, the Neo had a very like downward sloping treble response. It did have a peak in the upper treble like most of the 64 audio IMs do, but it wasn't to the same magnitude that something like the U12T, the U6T, um, or any of their other IMs really have it. Comparatively, the U4S just sort of elevates things all around in the treble. 
it has more energy at around like 10k hertz and then it also has a higher magnitude of energy in the peaks at around 15 to 17 gigahertz and this gives it a more lively sort of zingy trouble response compared to the neo which was much more l-shaped at the same time the u4s maintains a lot of what made the neo great it has that very nice base shelf very much sub base oriented and with the addition of the m12 modules you're going to get a nice in between between the mx which is pretty much dead neutral with a hint of warmth and the m20 which is the module of course that's going to give you the most base and the sort of the character that established the neo as a noteworthy base head I am. So yeah, the sound signature of the U4S is extremely flexible in my opinion. I definitely don't think it's going to be for everyone. I'm going to denote that now. If you look at the frequency response, the biggest point of contention I think for a lot of listeners is going to be uh, 64 audio sort of unique approach to the Pina gain regions. So from around two to 4K Hertz. What this means is that soprano oriented singers in particular are going to sound a bit more muted essentially on the highest registers of their voices and they're going to sound presented a bit further back in terms of the sound stage. But overall I have to say that this is a very very well tuned IM. It pretty much fits the bill exactly for what I'm looking for out of a more quote unquote colored or unconventional tuning that I tend to prefer. And something else that you might observe is that the U4S tracks very closely to the U12T's frequency response as well. I won't say that they sound entirely similar. They definitely have their discrepancies, especially in the trouble response, but you can basically think of the uh, U4S as a U12T with a dynamic driver that's been sort of scaled back in terms of technicalities to some degree. In terms of technicalities, I think that the U4S is a pretty interesting case study. Like I was saying, I think that the all balanced armature models in the 64 audio lineup, like the U12T and the U6T, they tend to image better for one. Um, if you're someone who wants like a very precise soundstage where like you can sort of pinpoint everything on the soundstage and everything is sort of pushed out a bit more, then those IMs are going to be suiting you better. And I think that if you look at the frequency response of these IMs, that's mostly just a product of the sort of recession at around from like eight to 10K Hertz that the U6T and the U12T tend to have more so than on the U4S. When you have more contrast between the lower treble and the upper treble on those IMs, I think it tends to sort of push instruments further out on the stage. And as a result, you're able to pinpoint individual instruments more easily. Something else that I'm going to point out is that the U16 and the U12T are also going to be more coherent than the U4S. And this is in the sense that the bass response on the U4S is very, how do I put this? It stands out quite a bit. And I think that can be good or bad depending on your listening preferences. For me, I like that characteristic. It tells me that there is I don't know, there's a DD in there, it's it's smacking me, it's very nice, it's very satisfying. But at the same time, I think that there are definitely some listeners who want a more seamless listen, and that's who the U60, the U12T are still going to be geared towards. But what advantages does U4S have over these balanced armature, these full balanced armature archetypes? I think that the first one is obviously going to be the level of like tactility and slam that you're going to get out of the U4S. It's just a very punchy IM. It sounds like it's pushing air, it sounds like notes are palpable and the 64 audio ims they do a better job of this than some other full balanced armature ims but they're still not the exception notes just tend to come off a little bit more plasticky they come off a little bit lighter in terms of their transients the other thing that the u4s definitely has going for it is definitely its sense of detail that is excellent extension on both ends of the spectrum particularly in the treble response where i think like a good majority of the detail that we hear in sound sort of stems from uh, especially past like 10k hertz and this has a lot of energy in those regions which is going to give you that sort of like trailing like edge to the decay of instruments and just transients in general that really makes those reverb trails and micro details pop that's what the u4s is really good at um, again it's not like the most pinpoint precise in terms of like a listener being able to distinguish where individual instruments are coming from but like the detail is definitely there to me let's talk about who the u4s is going to be for I think that the unique thing about the U4S is that it's tuned pretty much unlike anything in its price bracket is tuned like sans pretty much its own 64 audio brothers. If you look at something like the Monarch Mark II, for example, that is a very neutrally tuned IM. That's going to be for listeners who want something that's conventionally clean, conventionally well tuned, but just not very fun. That is not the U4S. The U4S is going to be for listeners who want something that is more colored, but at the same time pulls out desirable technical qualities 
that you wouldn't otherwise be able to achieve through conventional tuning, such as what the Monarch Mark II has. Again, it's not going to be as clean, as like neutral sounding as the Monarch Mark II, but at the same time, you're going to be getting technical qualities like that sense of bass slam and the imaging performance that the Monarch Mark II just doesn't have. Again, it really depends on what you're looking for sort of in your IMs. But the bottom line here, I think, is that the U4S has done two things that I personally index for when I am assessing whether to recommend an IM. One, it has fulfilled a niche within its price category that was previously missing. And two, it has superseded the existing competition, which in this case would be the Neo at $1,700. Now, the 64 Audio Neo might not be the best point of comparison given that the market has made great strides since its release, but given that the U4S undercuts the Neo by like a third of the price with comparable, if not better sound quality, it's really not hard to see why the U4S has my stamp of approval. Anyways, I think that's gonna wrap up this video review. Thanks so much for watching. I hope it was informative. And as always, if you guys want to get a sneak peek of some of the stuff that we're working on, then I suggest you check out our website, which has our written reviews, which tend to come out a little bit ahead of time of the video reviews, at least for my content. Okay, catch you guys in the next video.